All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him blessings and all his family members as well as all those who have struggled and strove through the years in a way that the deen has come to us. May Allah bless us all and may he grant us goodness. And really, may he grant us spouses who will be the coolness of our eyes. May he make us from those who can live happily ever after. I'm sure you're aware that this evening's topic is connected to marriage. And it is entitled happily ever after. Growing marriage for a lifetime. It is important for us to concentrate on the word growing because we grow. Many people don't know why they marry initially. In fact, the youth of today are bombarded by advertisements and by the media, by the television, the internet and so on, and by the glamour and glitter of the outside world that they don't even know how to choose a spouse. Mostly it is based on what someone looks like. That's a fact. And this is where the disaster occurs because many times they say, Allahu Akbar, may Allah protect us. Proof of the pudding is in eating. Allah grant us goodness. A pudding can look very great outwardly, but the minute you put it in your mouth, you realize this is not my cup of tea. May Allah protect us. Marriage is nothing like that. It is a deep institution. It is a union whereby male and female have come together by the decree of the Almighty using the name of the Almighty in a sacred union that has rights that need to be fulfilled by both parties. And the reason for marriage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear in the Quran. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very clearly that from his signs, and this is in Surah Al-Rum, is that he has created for you, from you, for yourself, a spouse that you may achieve comfort and solace in. And you may be happy and content by this relation. Allah wants the multiplication of man on earth. And this is the reason why he has beautified in the eyes of one gender the other. Because this beautification would result in a union which would result in the deed of intimacy which would result in reproduction which would result in the increase of mankind which would result in more who worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time the plan of allah for us all would be executed this is why we get married subhanallah for the plan of allah to be executed we get married as a result and a gift Allah has made for us beautification in the opposite sex. And this is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that people begin to work towards it. If it was not beautified for us, nobody would work towards it. And this is why it is unnatural and it is abnormal to be attracted to the same sex according to Islam. The reason why I say according to Islam is the world out there begins to say it is normal and natural and it is your human right to engage in gay behavior, but not in polygamous behavior. Allahu Akbar. Look at how the mind has been blocked and knocked. And when I say blocked and knocked, what I mean is if gay behavior was allowed by the same well-educated people of the globe and the so-called free world, what is wrong with polygamous behavior? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. And don't look at me like you don't know what I'm saying. Really, so those countries that do allow behavior that is homosexual, the question I have for them is, well, what is wrong with polygamous behavior? 
or a polygamous relation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Sadly, you have women folk who have had bad experiences with their spouses and even some who perhaps are very hooked onto television and so on who will probably say, no, it is okay to have, you know, homosexual behavior, but it is not okay to engage in polygamy. My brothers and sisters, it is not my rule. It is not your rule. It is the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it is going to be done correctly, and if it is going to be done properly, then nobody would really have any objection. The difficulty is today we choose the wrong way of engaging in polygamous relation. And this is why people are upset. It hurts people. It destroys homes because how we do it is actually wrong. And after we've done it, sometimes the way we carry ourselves is even more wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. So the introduction I chose for this evening is to make mention of why we marry. And I said it is in order to fulfill the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a gift, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has beautified the opposite sex. And this is something that we would work towards. You ask a young boy, a very young age, for your information, the age is becoming younger and younger because of the environment, because of genetically modified food, because of whatever else you would like to say. But at a younger age, they know more about marriage than sometimes those who are already married. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Just like with the gadgets of today, you find a little boy five years old will know more than his father about the iPhone. It's a fact. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. Recently, I was in South Africa speaking to a group of people and I told them from the age of eight and ten, you need to start speaking to your boys and girls about marriage. And a lot of them agreed with me. I think because they know that from that age, they already have their girlfriends and boyfriends. And they are already setting their minds and eyes on people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us goodness. And may he open our doors. Remember, as parents... It is a duty to communicate with your own children. Don't be shy. If you are not going to tell them what marriage is all about, what intimacy is all about, they will learn it from someone who will teach them the wrong thing. Perhaps they will learn it from a colleague at school or perhaps a teacher who is homosexual himself or herself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. It's a fact. It is happening on the globe and we are suffering as a result. So I call on parents to communicate with their children openly and to discuss with respect that which needs to be discussed. You are responsible. You are the one who will build the mind of your child as to how to look for a spouse. But if you've never ever spoken to your child about looking for a spouse, what type of a spouse do you expect them to look for? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. By right, we should be living in a world where we help them looking for the spouse. But me and I, meaning yourself and myself, we know very clearly that today that does not happen. In a lot of cases and instances, it does not happen. They come to you and impose on you their choice. And that's it. So it is best for you to help them make their choice by speaking about it whilst they are still quite young. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a good bond with our own children. And may he make us from those who are not affected by the adverse environment or who can protect ourselves from it in order to be uh, achieving the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters, we ask the Almighty to open our doors. In our midst, there are people who are married. There are those who are not married. There is no third probability. From amongst those who are married, there are some who may have more than one spouse. We will talk about that as well by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from amongst us who are married, there are some who do not have offspring. May Allah grant you offspring. There are some who have offspring. We've already touched on how important communication is with your offspring. But from amongst us, there are those who are not married yet. Or those who have been married and lost their spouses either due to divorce or death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open your doors once again. And for those whose doors have not been opened yet, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open those doors of yours and grant you spouses who will be the coolness of your eyes. It is important for us to know that the choice of person whom we marry is extremely important. This is why Allah says in the verse that I read moments ago, Allah says, indeed, in that there is a sign or there are signs for those who ponder. You need to ponder. You need to think. 
What is marriage all about? Wallahi, if you look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, people marry for several reasons. People marry, one narration says, for four reasons. Someone marries because of the wealth of a woman. You know, it is ironic. I've learned about the culture in this part of the world. It's quite different from the culture elsewhere as well. The cultures differ. I believe here a female does a lot in terms of financial contribution compared to other parts of the world. My brothers and sisters, sometimes there are some men who become wealthy because of marrying a wealthy woman. And after that, they make their wealth through the woman and then they want to harm the same woman whom they made their wealth through and they became rich via. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. That is unfair. That is very unfair. We need to know a woman may be married for her wealth, but that wealth may deplete. So it is something that is very short-lived. A woman may be married for her looks, but that looks, those looks of hers will somehow Subhanallah, I'd like to word this very carefully, would somehow change. And you find the trends of the world also changing as to what is good. Subhanallah. Good looks. There was a time when people who had a gap between their front teeth being considered as gorgeous. So everyone used to go and get a gap in their, you know, between the front teeth. And then there came a time when, no, you need straight proper teeth. So now everyone wants proper teeth. Then there is a time when, you know, people have a nose ring, they look good. So everyone has nose ring. Now there is a time when person with nose ring, no one wants to look at them. Subhanallah. So what is considered beautiful and good today may not be considered beautiful and good tomorrow in terms of beauty. And even if it is, the person whom you married for the beauty that you perceived within the physical features of that particular person, those features may disappear either in stages or instantly. So that is also short-lived. That is the second point. The third one, a female may be married because of her lineage or her status. Very high status, very lofty lineage, very top family. You know, that can be lost within a split second. A status can drop because of one deed, something that they have done comes crashing. Something that a member of the family has done comes crashing. So that is also short-lived. It is something that can go. But if a person is married for their deen, and their deen here referring to religion as well as character and conduct, both of them together make up what is known as deen. Deen is not just your spiritual department without character because the spirituality cannot be developed truly without character and conduct. So the two come hand in hand. So if you would like to know how religious a person really is, you need to study their character and behavior. It's very important. Sometimes you have a man who is very, very pious in terms of salah, in terms of big beard, in terms of his studies, what he has studied, and you find he may be fulfilling his prayers in the masjid, but he's, he has a very bad mouth. He lies. He swears. He deceives. He speaks very rough to people. Stay away from that man. He's not pious. It is just an outward show that is being shown to people. May Allah protect us. This is why the hadith says, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوهُ تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ عَرِيضٌ If a person comes to you and two things are good in that person, allow them to marry your daughter. If you don't allow them to marry your daughter, yet they have these two things in them, in that particular case there will be great chaos and corruption on the earth. This is what the hadith says. So today people, a man comes to marry the daughter, they say, brother, where is your salary slip for the last four months? And I want to see your bank balance. And let me see the type of phone you are using. The scent you are smelling is from India. I need something from France. Allahu Akbar. But brother, are you going to marry the man or your daughter? That's a question. And some of the scents from India are far better than the scents from France. Because in France, all they do is they buy it from India, they give it a good name, they put it in a better bottle and they resell it to the same Indians. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he open our doors. It's a matter of intellect. My brothers and sisters, so if those are the first questions we are asking the man we are losing, you look at his character. Does he read salah? Does he fulfill salah? What type of behavior? How does he speak to me? How does he come across? Is he a person who is full of arrogance or he might be a bit shy? Remember, sometimes people might say, this man doesn't know how to talk properly. What does that mean? Is it that he is arrogant? 
Is it that he is showing you negative qualities through his speech or is it that he is shy and he is not speaking much? That is, there is a difference between the two. Sometimes you have a young man who is not used to speaking to women and he's not used to being interrogated because of marriage. So when you ask him a question or two, he might not be able to be so eloquent and he might not be able to impress you with his speech because perhaps he is not used to it. For as long as he was not arrogant and he was not a bad man. And you can find out from others around in the locality, those whom he mixes with. Brother, which masjid do you go to? Go and speak to the imam in that masjid. Do you see this man in the masjid? Subhanallah. If that is the criteria, then we can live happily ever after. But if your criteria was the scent and the salary, tomorrow he can become jobless because of retrenching. And then he will also be wifeless after becoming wireless. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Allah, it's difficult. We are in an age where everything is less. You know, someone had sent me a beautiful SMS. It's a pity I don't have it with me right now about how we have become, you know, smokeless in, in terms of, you know, the, the, the lighters and what have you. And we have become wireless and we have become thisless and homeless and everything is actually becoming less and less and less. And even people are becoming clothless. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness really we are living in an age where if you are attracted to someone because of her legs remember if that is why you married her and she still has the exposition of those legs two things may happen one is there will come a time when a gash or a mark may develop on those legs so now you go for better legs astaghfirullah astaghfirullah or there may be someone who likes the same legs who has credentials better than yours so he steals her from you that can happen May Allah protect us. So remember, if you have gone for the deen, as I said, the hadith says two qualities. When they get to you and the man has asked you for your daughter, do not refuse unnecessarily. No, I had a problem with this man's grandfather. You know, one day he came to my shop and he did not pay me on time. So I'm not giving you. Wallahi, what foolish behavior is that? This is the opportunity to resolve the matter. Allahu Akbar. As it is, you will be paying a mahar. You will be paying a price. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May he make us from those whom when the dowry is to be paid, we have a simple straightforward amount and we do not make it difficult for our boys and girls. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to make mention of the statement of the age. What is it? Bear it in mind, remember it, memorize it, understand it and put it into practice. The more difficult we make marriage, the easier we have made adultery. Remember that. We are guilty of making adultery easy and facilitating it for our boys and girls. If we make their marriage difficult, do not think that they should just remain doomed until the end of life just because you are stubborn as a father or mother. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, really. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So much so that we would like our children to marry certain types of people because that is our dream. We want a good man who will look after our daughter or a good wife who will look after our son. Remember, it may be our dream, but my brothers and sisters, do not forget, you have to adjust your dreams that you have for your children as time passes because the deeds of those children will reword that particular dream or it will actually go back and rewrite that particular dream. Sometimes you want your child to be a hafiz, memorize the Quran, to study the deen, but the child is not inclined in that direction. You need to adjust your dream. Sometimes you want a beautiful life for your daughter, but she might come back divorced. You need to adjust your dream. Sometimes you might want something beautiful for your child, but he does not want that particular girl. He wants to marry someone who is ready to revert. Allahu Akbar. Listen to this. My brothers and sisters, I will open it bare in front of you. We have a crisis. What is the crisis? Yes, we look for someone who is Muslim. We look for someone who is good. We look for someone, mashallah, who has, you know, some form of deen in them. But believe me, today we have a problem. I was faced with a young man who came to me and he told me his whole story. So I met his father and his father told me, and these people are in a first world country. And his father told me, look, I will never, ever accept what my son wants. Impossible. I said, but why? He said, you know, she is a Christian. I said, she is prepared to revert, not for the marriage, but for purposes of the deen itself. 
And sometimes we have seen people who revert for purposes of marriage, but Allah gives them so much hidayah that they become better than born Muslims. I have seen it with my own eyes, with my own eyes. So I told him, brother, can I really speak to your heart? Will you open your heart to listen to what I have to say today? He says, no, I respect you a lot. When he said that, I seized the opportunity. I told him, if you respect me a lot, would you mind if I helped you make the decision? He was quiet. Because obviously he doesn't know what I'm about to say, but it's difficult because he is stubborn on one end. I told him, brother, he agreed after a while. He said, okay, inshallah, whatever you say, we will get it done. I said, brother, I have traveled a lot of countries. I have seen many people. And I have seen men who have married men and women who have married women. And I have seen people who claim to be following Islam who also have engaged in that type of so-called nikah. And I've seen so-called imams who have engaged in fulfilling or officiating so-called nikahs of so-called people of same sex. May Allah protect us. I said, brother, thank Allah that he wants to marry a woman, not a man. He looked at me and said, what do you mean? I showed him three people in his own city. I said, do you know these people are lost because they have gone out, abandoned their families in order to get married to a person of the same sex. He was shocked. He said, no, you have opened my eyes. I said, we do not promote that we leave our Muslim girls and go out further. No, but if it does happen that a man wants to marry a woman, thank Allah, we are living in a hostile environment. Wallahi, people are engaged in homosexuality to the degree that Islam would be disgraced as a result. You know, people sometimes in the first world country, they do not allow you to speak openly about gays and lesbians in a negative way. They don't allow you. In fact, you may be even blacklisted if you do that. So we have to be very careful how we word it because as Muslims, we do not allow it upon ourselves. Let's get that clear. We chose to be Muslims. If someone is living, for example, in Britain, they have a choice to be Muslim or not to be Muslim according to the British law. And they have a choice to choose. They have a choice what they want. So if they have chosen to be Muslim, what does it mean? It means through the freedom of the British law, they have imposed on themselves a set of rules and regulations within the rules and regulations of the British law, which now makes them known as a Muslim, which means they have chosen not to engage in gay activity and not to allow it for themselves. So that is through your freedom, you did not allow upon yourself to drink alcohol. So the same way through your freedom, you did not allow upon yourself to engage in this type of behavior. So one day I had a man who came to me and he said, no, 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 that's still a statement which is unfair. I said, okay, let me explain to you. You're a British man. He said, yes. If a man wants to be British and a citizen of Britain, would it be correct for him to say, I disagree with the laws of Britain, but I want to remain a citizen. I disagree with the citizenship laws, but I am going to be a citizen. It is not correct. He said, no, he will be stripped of his citizenship or he will not be granted it in the first place. I said, well, if a man wants to, through his freedom, say he's a Muslim, then he cannot say I'm a Muslim, but I disagree with Islamic rules. That means you are free to say I am not a Muslim. I'm someone else. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. So the point I'm raising my brothers and sisters is sometimes you will have to adjust your dream regarding the type of person that you want your child to marry. It is their choice. You can guide them. You will try with them. But believe me, you have to somehow give in at some stage. If it is a person whom you may not have considered ideal, because sometimes the other option is something which is even worse than what you are disagreeing with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. I know of many parents who refuse their daughters to get married to people they want to marry foolishly. Allow your daughter to make the mistake and to come back divorced being your daughter so happy with you and you will be able to guide her with love. My daughter, didn't I tell you anyway? Now you made the mistake. You have come home. We still love you. We embrace you and we still recognize you as our daughter. But it would have been better if you did not make the mistake. She will say, Dad, I love you forever for standing by me and for looking after me instead of saying never ever. And she becomes a person who, who is an eyesore for you. She becomes depressed because today people become depressed when they cannot marry whom they want to marry. 
And it's our fault. We sent them to the schools. We sent them to the various mixed type of educations. We did this. We did that. We had a place in the mall where we were every week. We did not dress them appropriately when they were young. So as they grew up, they did not want the appropriate dress. We are the ones who, who placed them in front of the televisions and we subscribe to the dirtiest of the internet channels or satellite channels and so on. And then we expect our daughters to still have a good Islamic choice of a spouse. Who is the hypocrite? Father of the home. Big hypocrite. May Allah protect us. Why? Where are you? What did you allow your daughter to do all along? And now you want to come in and say, no, I allowed you to become a mango, for example. But, but now, for example, I want you to be a banana. Astaghfirullah. Allahu Akbar. I'm giving you an example of fruit because just before I entered here, we had a bit of fruit. May Allah grant us goodness. The fruit of Sri Lanka. MashaAllah. So my brothers and sisters, it's not fair. Do you know that when a child is born, Allah gives you almost 100% control over that child. You dress the child, you name the child, you decide when to bath the child, what the child will eat. All control. Don't say, I don't have control over my child. Allah said, I gave you full control when the child was born. That's the time you did not dress the child properly. You never read your own salah. You, there was no Quran ever played. There was nothing. And slowly, slowly, as the child grows up, one by one, Allah takes away the control of elements from you regarding that particular child. So when a child is a little baby, you can give the child a rattle, a rattle worth one rupee and it will shake the rattle and smile and laugh with you. Let the child become five years old. Give them the rattle. They will throw it back at your face. Dad, are you playing a fool with me? I need an iPhone. <laughs> so at a certain stage, you had control over the child. What did you do when you had control over your child? Did you guide the child? This is why I say speak to the child earlier because today we are losing control earlier. You can dress your child how you want when the child is two years, three years, even if the clothing is torn. Let the child get to eight years, nine years. Dad, I'm not wearing these shoes. Why? You make me look like one of those people living in the 1960s. Dad, I need the latest, you know, this Nike Air where you, you walk, it bounces, you know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, grant us goodness and ease. My brothers and sisters, don't blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our failure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us success. So this is why I say, sometimes we need to adjust. The reason is, how can we allow or how can we faci facilitate for our children to live happily ever after when we did not... Let them marry the person they wanted. We made them marry someone they did not want. Now, obviously, I'm talking of something which is not the ideal. Ideally, ideally, Islamically, we need to speak about what should be happening. The parents of the girls and the brothers or the relatives should keep an eye. When they see potential husbands for their daughters or their sisters and so on, they should approach the gentleman or his family or they should speak to their daughter about it we have so and so we are trying to you identify you speak to them you let the two meet within the limits of the sharia and if they would like to take it further you take it further it's your responsibility as a male that is ideal and if this daughter says no i'm not too happy don't be angry no pressure my sister you have the right it is haram in islam to force your daughter to marry whom you want when she does not want totally forbidden it is a major sin in fact you cannot do that it is her choice she can say no at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam also there were those who said no i don't want to marry this man and they were not forced to it may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness the only time we can force someone is revel if revelation has been revealed to say these two must be married then we have no choice but revelation will not be revealed in the case of us may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness so in that particular case, maybe she doesn't want to marry the first, the second, the third. You have introduced her to five or ten with respect. And when I say with respect, you can find out from the scholars exactly how that should happen. What type of arrangement. You don't just say, okay, pick up my daughter at nine o'clock and bring her back at twelve o'clock. That's not how you meet in Islam. It must be in your presence in the sense that you are close at hand. The reason is... Shaitan comes to the boys or the girls sometimes and makes them abuse one another in a way that wallahi they are left like used toilet paper without any form of respect and then they say no I don't want to marry you. May Allah grant us goodness. May Allah grant us really the opening and may he open our doors. So someone says but why can't I get to know him more? You can. 
You can get to know him much more. You can meet five times. You can meet more than five times. But the rules of meeting are still the same. You will meet with your chaperone, with your mahram. You will meet with them close at hand. Come to your house or we got, come to yours. One of the two. Either I come to yours, you come to mine. And we meet with total transparency in, in the or within reach of your mahram who is right there may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness so no one can fool you and you talk you understand how you are communicating and you may say no you know this is not uh, really my cup of tea and with respect you can turn that down turn the next one down the third one down no problem until the 35th one comes you might want to say yes allahu akbar i'm just giving you a scenario that can happen it has happened sometimes one or two people agree sometimes they don't agree don't worry but remember, when you have turned one down, you may not get another one. Remember that. And when you have turned one down, you may not get another one as good as the one you have turned down. So you need to be very careful. And this is why we say, guide your child. My daughter, how do you feel? How is this man? What is wrong with him? Let's speak about it. Oh, I don't feel right. Okay, no problem. Let's see. And if they still feel we don't want, this is the ideal. Sadly, today, daughter's gone to university. She comes back, dad. You are lucky if she tells you. Allahu Akbar. You are lucky if she tells you. Very lucky. Fortunate. At least you are not heading up the wrong tree. Because people are busy looking for someone. They don't know that already there is another monkey on the tree. <laughs> it happens. A lot of cases. And this is why I salute and respect those children who can openly say, You know what, Dad? I have done something wrong. And this is what it is. And Dad, you don't just lift up your, your, your fist and start fisting your children. No understand that you are also responsible do not get angry you need to deal with something that has come into your home this is when they will be able to live happily ever after you know whilst i'm talking i see a few elderly people here wallahi my due respect to you we are now speaking of the age of today we are not speaking of how it used to happen in your time we are speaking of how it is happening today it is a reality on the ground so please excuse sometimes people might feel this man was too open you know he's encouraging our sons and daughters to do this and that wallahi they are already doing it so stop blaming me we know and this is why if you see me inshallah we when we grow of age we will give the platform to younger people so we can learn from them how to tackle our own children believe me it's a crisis i'm not joking what is the point of brushing your problem under the carpet completely until one day when that carpet is rolled, you notice that all the dirt is underneath. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May he grant us happy homes. So my brothers and sisters, I always like to encourage people to listen to their children. Look at the view. What do they have? Who do they want to marry? Sometimes we have our sons or our daughters, more so the daughters. They have arrived at a late age, for example, you know, 30, 35. They are stigmatized in society because they, they are 30, 35. And sometimes the father just does not budge. And he says, look, you sort out your life. Why? And sometimes the other women of society stigmatize them to the degree that they are not invited to functions outside. Why now you are well past your sell by date. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. I don't think you really understood what I said there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Nobody is well past their sell by date, my brothers and sisters. Remember, it's your duty, your responsibility. You could be 30, 40, 50, no harm. You need to still actively look for your child, for a spouse. And even if you as a male or a female have come across someone whom you may feel is a potential spouse, open your mouth. Without opening your mouth, you are guilty. Believe me, don't just sit and think that suddenly in your bedroom, he's going to really plop out of the ceiling. Allahu Akbar, it's not going to happen. You need to open your mouth, speak, say something. Talk to your family, talk to someone. Get a message across to his sisters or someone. And it is best to work with your family because your family will be able to guide you along. They will need to support you. And if you have a difficulty, speak to the ulama. And I really plead with those who are slightly older, when you have your children, listen to them. Understand that this is a new generation. They, their thinking will not be like yours. And with their children, it is an even newer generation. Their thinking will be even more different. One wonders. Sometimes I sit and I'm worried. How are my children going to get married or yours? Later on, those who are younger, what will happen to them? We are worried. Wallahi, because society is changing rapidly. What was the case 10 years ago is no longer the case today. Wallahi, life has changed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So... 
We said two qualities when they come to you, do not deny. Deenahu wa khuluqahu. The religion of a man and his character and conduct, which makes part of his spirituality. If those two qualities are found in the man, his deen is okay and his character and conduct is okay. He has come and asked for your daughter. Your daughter is keen and interested. Don't say no for nothing. If you say no, the hadith says there is going to be great chaos on earth. What happens? Suddenly the jinn gets into your daughter's head or sometimes the boy, sometimes he might find someone else, but the daughter suffers more. She suffers much more. Because something that was close at reach, you know, dad has blocked it, mom has blocked it, it's something, and she would suffer a lot. And there is no shortage of women, there is a shortage of good men, believe that. There is a shortage of good men, and I plead with all the youth who are here, become good men. We don't want men, we want good men. Responsible, those who know marriage is about really getting together with someone who is suitable to be the mother of your children so that you can continue the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the point of having children in number who are worshipping shaitan? Rather have children who are worshipping Rahman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this is why the youth, remember your bad habits like smoking, drugging, clubbing, pornography, wasting time on the telephone and you know, I sit here in Sri Lanka because of the time difference. Sometimes it's difficult to fall off to sleep because time difference of various countries and where I come from and so on. Sitting and you see, mashallah, the world in Colombo is online at three in the morning. Allahu Akbar. Three in the morning. Someone messages you back. Allahu Akbar. But here in Colombo, it's three o'clock. Brother, you are not from Africa. You are supposed to be asleep. No, I'm just covering my back as to why I was awake. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, what a beautiful relation we have. Look, we are Muslimin. We are talking about our deen. We are talking of crises that are facing society today. The youth, leave your bad habits. You need really to be a good man so that you are able really to rear the champions of the ummah of tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. And the same applies to the sisters. Sometimes we get caught up and hooked onto, you know, Facebook and Twitter and this man and that man and using it wrongly. You see, it's like a knife. You can either use it in the correct way or you can use it in the wrong way. More so people are using it in wrong. This is why if someone were to ask me, I would tell you I strongly discourage Facebook and Twitter and these social networks. Strongly discourage. You might say, well, why are you found there? Well, go and see how we use it. If you are using it in the same way, then perhaps you might want to revise that ruling. May Allah grant us goodness. But if you are using it to socialize, hello and how are you? I know of a case and I'm going to say it bare. Where there was a man who put a false image of someone else on his profile and he lured a young girl who was in her teenage to the degree that he flew across the ocean to meet her in a certain country and yet he was 65 years old a man with a totally false identity may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our sisters our daughters and our sons as well and this is why we say a zina daynun you know zina is actually a, a credit you have you have borrowed something it is going to be recompensed within your family members you need to remember this and this is something that has been said by the scholars of a four time. Engage in Toba, you can stop that. That's the beauty. They say if you fiddled with someone's daughter, someone is fiddling with your daughter. Allahu Akbar, you better engage in Toba so that nobody messes around with your children. Allahu Akbar. Remember this. Don't think that when you do something, it does not have a reaction. Kama tadinu tudanu. As you do to others, so it shall be done to you. Unless you engage in tawbah and you ask Allah's forgiveness and you mend your ways and your habits. So remember this. Today we are facing a crisis in society because the man who is angry at what his daughter is trying to do is already himself involved with three other women illicitly. It's happening in society. And then we want to live happily ever after. It cannot work that way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, grant us goodness and open our doors. So as we were saying... The, the religion is important and the khuluq is important, character and conduct. Then what will happen, inshallah, we will support our children. We will live happily with them. We, inshallah, begin now. Now I will, I will mention a few pointers of how it is 
that the marriage itself should be handled so that we can achieve the mercy of Allah. I tell you why. Marriage is not just a joke. It's not just a social sort of a thing that happened. No, it is a sacred union. And Allah has said, Ij'aluha fi masajidikum. Keep it in your masjids. It is best for you to have it in the masjid, the house of Allah. Because you are going to mention the name of Allah. There are several verses that will be read and you will see those verses in a few moments. I will inshallah go through them. And it is important for us to know that the house of Allah is that which has the greatest blessing in it. So your nikah, firstly, don't delay it. Do not delay nikah unnecessarily. Once nikah is ready, the two parties are happy, get that nikah done. So that any relation that happens between them thereafter happens in a way that is permissible. Remember that. Sometimes people say, no, my daughter is engaged. Brother, three years later, your daughter, no, she's engaged. I say, but brother, three years have passed. She had two abortions in the process. Do you know that? I'm not joking. I'm serious. My parents, you don't know what we know. They come to us for help when they cannot talk to you. I know. We cry when we see the children of the good people. Sometimes people we know and they come to us. You know what? I have this problem and that problem. But sister, you are engaged to the man. How could this have happened? You know, my father told me you cannot marry now. You are still studying. My, my, my. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. Really. Brothers and sisters, open your eyes. See what is going on. Ask the people what is happening. If you think we are not living in an era of hypersexuality, you are dreaming. You are dreaming. You are living in a dream world. We are living in the dirtiest society up to this age. There has never ever been a more hypersexual society than ours. Believe me, everything out there is about sex. And I'm saying this because I have to fulfill my duty as a scholar of Islam to explain to the people what is going on out there and how we are heading in the wrong direction because we are living with blinkers. We don't even know what's happening. Ask your children in the universities what's going on. If you have a good link with them, they will inform you. Ask them. Tell them what is happening or ask what is happening in the malls or in the shopping centers or at the workplace. You know, you can be the best and the, the, the most pious Yes, if Allah has granted you protection, you will always be protected. May Allah grant us goodness. There are people amongst us and I'd like to hope that the bulk of us seated here, pure good people by the will of Allah, you know how difficult it is to remain on that path. You know how easy it is to sin. Today it is easier to sin than it is to abstain from it. Allahu Akbar. It is easier to abandon your hijab than it is to don it. It is easier to leave your salah than it is to fulfill it. That is because the environment has made it so difficult to engage in that which is correct. But my brothers and sisters, this is why I say do not delay nikah. It's not just my statement. It is a teaching that has come to us from the best of creation. Don't delay it. And at the same time, do not make it difficult in any way. We already spoke about the mahar, the dowry or whatever else it is. Either way, don't be too demanding and do not become a person who really makes it tough on their sons and daughters to get married. Because in that particular case, we will be held accountable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it that you as a parent did this to your own daughter? You doomed her, you punished her. And this is what you did to your son. You made him, you, you really made him leave the deen in totality. It brings me to one example, living example, where there was a young boy whose father was being so tough with him that, listen to this, he wanted to marry someone who was ready to revert. So his father told him, no, not over my dead body. What am I going to tell my friends and society, my brothers and my sisters, my this, my that? Brother, Izza is from Allah. Your status is from Allah. If you had embraced this, it was going to be much better. So you can explain to your friends and your family, look, you know, I tried my best, but today's society, you know, sometimes the children are doing their own thing and we have to try our best saddidu wa qaribu to make the most of what it is and to guide them as best as possible. And, you know, we will see how best they can manage. But instead of that, this father chose to say over my dead body. So what did the son do? He asked for help from some of the scholars and so on. And sometimes there is a limited amount of help you could actually offer because if a man is being stubborn, you cannot really win. So after some time, 
he converted and left the fold of Islam and gone. Why? Because to him, he, he, the child was lost and the father is still proud of his action. I don't mind if he became a non-Muslim, but at least nothing happened against my will. And he told his family members, you know, uh, the, you, your children, if they want to do the same thing, you should also engage in this type of thing. How? The man, the woman was ready. So I had an opportunity to address this young boy. And when I spoke to him, he told me something that is really a question of the age. When I say question of the age, I mean sometimes the mind starts asking these questions. He said, you know, this woman is such a good woman that I married. She has so many good characters and conduct. She told me I'm ready to do anything. You know, I explained to her about the little I know about Islam and she was ready. And then what happened is when my father and my parents said no and everybody disagreed and they, you know, the mother, he says, my mother didn't really mind, but she has to follow what my father says. So after some time, I, they questioned me, her parents to say, look, we were all okay for our daughter to, you know, to enter the fold of Islam. Now, if, he, if she is not going to enter the fold of Islam, then why don't you enter our faith? So he said, yeah, it makes sense. You see, he said, yeah, it makes sense if, we, if they refuse, I, I will not refuse you. People are not refusing. So he says that is what made him turn. Now look at this. The young boys of today, this is the logic they are using. They will not tell you Islam is correct and Islam believes in all the previous messengers and Islam, Allah is one. Even the father perhaps doesn't read Salah correctly, but he was proud with his action. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive that man. Really, we tried very hard, but to be honest with you, it is only Allah who can bring people back. That's why I say it is foolish. Sometimes you might lose your child totally. Rather you lose them 20%. Allahu Akbar. Like I said, you know, moments ago, and this is very true. I've said it here in Colombo in the past and I want to repeat it. We have instances where people come and say, you know, Sheikh, there is a jinn. My daughter has a jinn. You say, okay. So the daughter says, I see stars at night. I hear voices. You know, uh, this is what happens when I go this way. I see a shadow. I, this that happens. That happens. I know default, this girl could not marry the man she wanted to marry and so she is seeing stars because now she's not eating, now she's not drinking, now she is seeing things, now her life is coming to a mess and so on or sometimes it's connected to diet. Diet meaning, you know, because someone told her you're too fat, you know, you're not good looking. So she stops eating so there is no protein, no minerals, no vitamins, no nothing in the body. So she starts seeing stars, the blood pressure is low and she starts, you know, so you tell her two, two or three things. Firstly, you say, you know, jinn does not like a person who is very strong, you know, good, you know. The hadith says, a believer who is strong, and strong both, meaning in your belief and even physically, is more loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than one who is weak in belief and weak physically. Intentional physical weakness is something that is wrong. Do you know that? If you are physically weak and you are doing nothing about it, that is wrong. Islamically also it is wrong. So anyway, you tell them to have their dairy products and their red meat and so on within a certain limit and suddenly the jinn is gone. That was not a jinn, that was just your diet. And sometimes you ask them a straight up question. Are you married? No. Do you want to marry a particular person? They keep quiet. Father is sitting there, that's the problem. <laughs> he is the disaster, that is the jinn. The father is the jinn. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allah protect us and grant us ease. May Allah open our doors. You know, I'm speaking from a lot of experience. I'm not joking with you. A lot of experience. We know what goes around. So you find your child is very sick and ill. Sometimes it is because of some form of imbalance within the home, not necessarily in the mind. But imbalance in the house then causes an imbalance in the brain. Then when your child becomes totally mental, requiring medication for the rest of their lives, who are you going to blame? Allahu Akbar, it was simple for you, but you made it tough on yourself. Look at how today we have only started speaking, but we are speaking so much of reality on the ground. Because this is why we do not live happily ever after. Wife, after 10 years, tells the husband, I never ever wanted to marry you. Do you know that? But it took you 10 years to tell me. And husband says, guess what? I was also forced. <laughs> what is the point? What is the point? Their parents are foolish. 
Man is telling his wife after so many years, I was forced. I didn't want to marry you. And the woman is saying, I didn't want to marry you. So who is responsible for not allowing the couple to live happily ever after? And at the same time, there are three couples that are saying the same thing to each other. Because that man, the, wife, the one he wanted to marry is telling the same statement to her husband. And that woman, the one whom she wanted to marry is telling the same statement to... Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. This is called illa taf'aluhu takun fitnatun fil ardi wa fasadun arid. This is why the hadith says if you are not going to allow that marriage, there will be great chaos and fitna on earth. All marriages are breaking up. Today when people get married, we need to ask, so when is it breaking? Allahu Akbar. Because more marriages, I was thinking that more marriages are breaking than happening. So someone might say, but that can't be the case. It can be the case because this year, if there have been 200 marriages and 300 divorces, those of last year are also divorcing now. Allahu Akbar. As time is progressing, there are people who are unhappy in marriage. If I were to tell you, my brothers and sisters, without exaggeration, that more than half of us sitting here have a problem at home, I don't think I would be lying. I'm sorry to say this. I'm very sorry. I apologize in advance. I might be wrong. But according to what I know, I think I've worded it carefully. I'm not saying that you are breaking or your marriage is broken, but we do not have a problem at home. I don't think so. I think more than half of us would, would, would admit if we had to that we have a problem at home. Why? Because of something. What is the thing? Ask yourself, the day you were married and you said, yes, I accept her as my wife, the name of Allah was used. The verses were read. You don't even know the meaning of those verses up to today. And you led your life in a way that was not in that direction. So today you are sitting with a problem. Sin actually reduces the chances of living happily ever after. When you want to sin and you do not want to uh, be responsible, you will reduce the chances of living happily ever after. And when you were married, you were so happy. Are you as happy as you were that day, today? If the answer is no, what went wrong? Diagnose it, change it. Let me quickly read for you the three verses that are read in Khutbatul Hajah, which is often repeated when it comes to Nikah. The first one. Ya Oh, you, oh people, Allah starts by saying, oh people, the beginning of Surah An-Nisa. Be conscious of your maker, your Rabb, your nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider. Be conscious of the one who is in absolute control of every aspect of your existence which means develop your piety. O oh people, be conscious of your maker, the one who created you from a single soul, who is Adam. And from it, he created Hawa, he created its spouse. And from the two of them, he caused the multitude to spread on the earth. From the two of them. Fear him or be conscious of him and un understand you are answerable to him. Allah says, Wattaqullaha and be fearful of Allah, be mindful of Allah, be conscious of Allah. Alladhi tasa'aluna bih. The one whose name you use when you are asking one another, or you want someone to believe you, or you want to believe them, you want them to use the name of Allah. This verse is making mention of how sacred the name of Allah is. Be conscious of that Allah whose name you consider so sacred. Allahu Akbar. And be conscious of the wombs. What's the meaning of the wombs? The female, the women, your mother, your sister, your wife, your daughter. Be conscious of them and their right over you. Are you fulfilling it or not? Allahu Akbar. And Allah says, Inna Allah kana alaykum raqiban. 
Allah is very, very watchful over you. Raqib, someone who is watching very carefully, taking note of that which is going on. So behind closed doors, watch out how you treat your women. Be careful, your mother, your daughter, your wife, your spouse, meaning your, your sister and so on. Be careful, Allah says, I am watching. And Allah is all watchful. That is the first verse. Allah is warning us to say, be careful. The womb that gave birth to you and the womb that gave birth to your children. I want to stop there for a moment. Today we look for any reason to break the marriage. Do you know that? Any problem we look, we look for that which will make us part ways. Why is it that our fathers and the previous generations lasted longer? Because they did the opposite. What did they do? They looked for the smallest reason to hold the marriage together. That's the difference. We look for the smallest reason to break it. We have stopped helping our spouses through a problem. We rather opt out of the problem. That is a crisis. You will never live happily ever after. You caught your husband doing something wrong. Two things. Immediately today, they would say, I'm going home, I want a divorce. Out. Why? Because one thing went wrong. The man made a mistake. Something happened. He fell into the trap of shaitan. And now the house must be broken. That is stupidity and foolishness. It really, if the, a house was supposed to be broken for a mistake of a man or a woman, all our houses would be broken by now. Every one of them. Tell me who has not made a mistake here. Allahu Akbar. We had obviously mistakes are of a different nature. We are not talking of, you know, certain types of errors that are sometimes perhaps beyond a certain limit. No, but we are talking of errors and mistakes. Sometimes things do occur. A, a while back, when the spouse made a mistake, the wife would say, look, this is very bad. I will not, you know, expose your, you to others. I will try and help you. You need really to stop doing this. And she bore not only patience, because nowadays the young girls don't like the word sabr. Sometimes young boys and girls, you tell them make sabr. They say, you are one of those mullahs who came from Afghanistan. What do you think, man? We must sit and make sabr. Well, to be honest with you, there are people in the Western world who also make sabr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Sabr is a beautiful word. Allah calls it beautiful. Isbir sabran jamilan. Bear patience, a beautiful patience. So instead of bearing patience, what they want, they don't want to bear patience anymore. Small thing and it's gone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. As I was saying, a while back, a problem happens, they would help each other through the difficulty. I know of cases, and I'm sure your parents and grandparents, whose financial condition was so bad that they did not have a house which was decent to live in, but the marriage did not break. Today, you don't have a washing machine at home. She says, I want to go home. I need a divorce. Why? You think I'm going to wash? She's a princess, brought up being called my princess by her father. Now she's not used to lifting one spoon. Allahu Akbar. One spoon, I can't. Why? Where is the servant? Otherwise, I'm going home. This is why we tell those who are wealthy, may Allah grant you barakah in your wealth. Remember, do not allow that wealth to create a standard of daughter who will not be able to be a wife of someone else. Remember this. Because when you have brought up a princess, you can only get her married to a king. Remember that. And as I told you, there is a shortage of kings. So what will happen? She will go and she will say, in my father's home, I never cooked. So now you are sitting back. My fathers and mothers who are here today, let me explain. Even if you are from a good home, that is Allah has blessed with wealth, get your daughters trained to do the certain duties that they may have within the home that is what it is and i don't even want to get into the debate as to should she cook in the house or should she not cook what is this wallahi look when there is a role to be fulfilled you fulfill it we have not got to a point where we want to argue and we want to mix and we want to do this and that in islam we believe that men and women are equal equality in terms of spirituality but physically they are different emotionally they are different and their roles that they need to play in terms of their gender is absolutely and totally different we believe this and the whole world agrees with it and i've told you in the past in this city that there are loos that you will find even outside this hall. There is a picture of a man and a woman which, which says this toilet is for males and that is for ladies, gents and ladies. Why do they have separate toilets? Because they admit and they agree 
that the people are different physically, they are different emotionally, they are different. And to be honest with you, I, when I entered one, you know, public loo in one of the airports, I was shocked because two men entered holding hands. I said, this is more dangerous than having a, a, a loo which is mixed. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, may Allah safeguard us. When you see two men holding hands, hugging each other, entering the loo, you are supposed to be worried. They should have a separate toilet for those type of people. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. This is society. And these are things we have seen. And sometimes they are hidden from the eye of the innocent. You know, we, sometimes you have an old elderly person. He's never seen those things. He's not bothered. He doesn't know how the internet works and so on. I am surprised. I want to tell you, Sri Lankans are some of the most advanced when it comes to the internet. Believe me, very advanced. Indians and this, this part of the world, completely. You will find everybody. You want to get a message across, one little tweet, the dunya knows about it. It's a fact. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So this is why my brothers and sisters, we say, and we repeat, and we reiterate, we need to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to ask Allah for guidance. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. The verse that I read, the first verse of that khutbah, Allah is warning us, watch out how you treat your women. Look at what happens. Like I said, do not break your marriage because of one thing or two things or five things. No, your duty is to work hard. I know of cases and I'm sure you would. Like I said, your parents and grandparents, perhaps they did not even have proper homes and yet your grandmothers and mothers lived with them. That is when you were born. And that is how you grew up without shoes. Today, if your husband cannot afford a shoe and your husband has lost his job, people say, I'm going home. Why? Because my lipstick you can't afford anymore. Allahu Akbar. May Allah safeguard us. And I think in some societies, it's the other way around. Man sitting back at home, relaxing. He says, I'm divorcing you. Why? You're not bringing enough money into the home. Look at how the world has become upside down. The world has become upside down. So we need to be careful. Remember, look for something small that will hold your marriage together. Do not look for something small that will break your marriage. How they lived happily ever after was they helped each other through their crises and problems. They bore patience for eight years, for 10 years, for 15 years. After that, they lived happily ever after without that patience and without Correcting one another without accepting correction. You may never ever live happily ever after because there will come a time when you will be completely lost. Remember the sweetness of the fruit of patience that was born for eight years is so sweet that it will last 80 years and even beyond. Sweetness of sabr and patience is something that is really it needs to be tasted in order to be understood. So I call on the young boys and girls of today, those who are married. Remember, your spouse has one weakness. Work with him. Try and help him or her. And try and, you know, learn to forgive. That's something big. We spoke about it yesterday. When you hold a grudge, it's excess baggage. And wallahi, it is. If you learn to forgive, wallahi, you will appreciate your life happily ever after. Why we say this? Today, when your son, listen to this point. When your son or your daughter does something major that is wrong, you are ready to forgive them. But when the father of that son or daughter does the same thing wrong, you are not ready to forgive them. But he is the father. He was there before the child. Allahu Akbar. You follow? And with the mother as well. Your daughter did something wrong. You can forgive her. But the mother of your daughter did the same thing wrong. I can't forgive her. But she was there before that one. In fact, she... The daughter was a result of the union between you and the mother of that daughter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. I am saying this just to make us think. It is not necessary for us to just bear sabr when we really cannot endure it anymore. No, Islam comes to your help and says, no, there are certain cases when divorce is really only the option that you have right now. That we know. We are not denying that. But today we are talking of happily ever after. If divorce happens to be the only choice out of a specific issue then subhanallah that will be the way and perhaps that will grant you a life happily ever after but today we are talking about growing in marriage not growing in divorce the second verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون. O you who believe, be conscious of the Almighty as He is meant to be. Meaning according to His level. Be conscious of Him according to His level. Obviously that is something very difficult. And do not die except in the condition of submission. Which means lead your whole life in the submission of Allah, you will be happy. If you lead your life in the submission of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be happy. Because Allah has the solution to your problems. And Allah has laid rules and regulations to help you avoid any problems whatsoever. If you understand the plan of Allah, you have the knowledge of the deen, you have abstained from what Allah has asked you to abstain from, and you have thanked Allah, you have engaged in what He has asked you to engage in. In that case, even if something happens in your life that others would consider negative for you, it is a win-win situation. Now this verse is read, Khutbatul Haja. It is that important khutbah which was repeated by Muhammad sallallahu so many times. A lot of us don't even know that we are supposed to be in submission. And from this verse, we can also pause for a moment and we can learn a lesson that my brothers and sisters, when you engage in sin, your marriage cannot work as such. You cannot guarantee yourself the happily ever after title. You cannot. Why? Because you are engaged in sin. Who owns that happily ever after title? Who can give it to you? Allah. So if you are in transgression, if you are against the commands of Allah, do you think that will happen? Sometimes you might be very happy, your spouse is excited, you are excited, you live for 30 years, the problems come after your child grows old. Then the problem comes. When sometimes your grandchild can cause distress for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May He make us from those who can be the coolness of the eyes of our parents. And may He make our offspring the coolness of our eyes. I mean. So this is why we say don't sin. When you sin, you have reduced the chances of living happily ever after. The third verse. The third verse I would like to think in terms of marriage is one of the most important verses. Ya sadida. O you who believe, be conscious of Allah. Look, this has repeated itself for the fourth time now. Two times in the first verse, once in the second verse, and once in the third verse. Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And only utter that which is upright. Your tongue. 99% of problems in marriage are connected to the wrong use of the tongue. Abuse of the tongue. Or not occupying the tongue with that which is beneficial. So the tongue, the Quran says, and this verse is repeated. Even in the khutbah of nikah, khutbatul haja, it is repeated in that. And the Prophet ﷺ used to repeat it a lot. If you know how to use your tongue, you can save a marriage. Subhanallah. Praise your wife, talk to her, say good words. Or your husband, tell them how good looking they are. Tell them how you appreciate their sacrifice for you. My brothers and sisters, marriage is about sacrifice. The more you have sacrificed, the more you will win the heart of your spouse. Sometimes even if they don't like you that much because of a word you might have uttered or a mistake you might have made, your sacrifice will act as a soothing cream over that particular gash that might have been caused and very soon the mark will be gone. Why? Because you say, you know, I appreciate you really. You have sacrificed, you have given birth to so many of my children and so on. And you have done this and you have done that. You appreciate because there comes a point in the life of man when he realizes that allegiance is with the one who has sacrificed for him all along. What this means is, some people, as they're growing up, you know, they're interested in this one and that one. But brother, you are married. They're interested still in that one, this one here, good looking, this person, that person, good looking, and so on. And you know, that person is very eloquent and this person is like this and like that. But there comes an age when they realize, you know what, my wife is the best. Why? She cooked for me, she cleaned for me, she has my children, she stayed awake with those children, she brought them up, she did this, she did that, she tried her best, she's religious, she's trying to please Allah, she is at the same time this and that. She might be seven kilos overweight, so what? And even if she's 70 kilos in total, we don't mind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Why? Because you realize 
that now you're old. You, get, you, you cannot continue following these little small models of the age like we said yesterday and the day before. It's not like you're going to get them anyway. And even if, if you want them, they will not want you. Perhaps they might want your money and they might want something for a little while and after that they are also finding someone who has more wealth than you and perhaps slightly younger. Allahu Akbar. May Allah safeguard us. May He grant us goodness. My brothers and sisters, when a person has faltered, how do they make things right? Like I was saying, the nikah, how should it take place? It must be simple, very simple nikah. We must not try and compete with the Joneses. No, that that family had a very big nikah with 2,000 guests. We want to have one with 3,000 guests. That family gave this gift. We want to have that. No, you are making it difficult. There will be no barakah in that marriage. You can invite how many people you want. Keep it simple. Keep it segregated, separated. Make sure you understand it is a religious function. It is not a social function. Understand that. It is a function that is sacred. And this is why treat it as though it is a function that is held because of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And then you will understand. Today we have, you know, people who get together, music is blasting, men and women are there. The, the, the bride who sometimes is very religious, the day she's getting married, her hair is showing, her cleavage is showing, her legs are showing, she's sitting in front of all the men and the husband comes in, he's supposed to be a religious person, but even he chooses clothes that do not depict any religiousness at all and he wants to sit right in front of everyone and everyone is taking pictures and congratulating them and all the young boys and girls. It has happened where a man has seen a woman at his own marriage prettier than his wife so he divorced his wife to marry that woman wallahi i'm not telling you a lie it is a true story look at this why because we don't do our things properly and then some some of us say no man these people are like i said mullahs from afghanistan astaghfirullah wallahi this is a, this is a religious ruling i mean if someone tells you read your salah it does not make them a bad person if someone tells you look this is a proper religious function which is spiritual i had the opportunity of sitting next to a rabbi in one of the aircrafts and i learned so much because a lot of their rules and regulations are very very close to islam they are stricter than us in so many things and that is the pure judaism subhanallah but their followers will not go out and say, no, it's a barbaric religion. But we sometimes would like to go out and challenge our own religion. And we don't want. Why is it? Let us not become dissolved in the cauldron of westernization. Dissolved in the cauldron of Satanism. Dissolved in the cauldron of worshipping our own desires. That shouldn't be the case. May Allah protect us. Really. You have a marriage that is simple. You are invoking the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now they will be, if they have a problem and it is not, you know, you cannot have a marriage which does not have any problem whatsoever. There will always be some form of an issue, small or big. But when you have had a proper marriage, then you need to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will come to the assistance of the particular people who are involved. So this is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we have had a marriage which was totally wrong and as i said we had extravagance and everything was gone wrong and so on and so forth in that particular case we need to engage in tawbah ask allah to forgive you so that we are not penalized as a result of the wrong that we did not penalized and wallahi what i'm saying is real i have studied marriages where you have people who have abandoned the law of allah for those few hours of the walima or few hours of that function they abandon the law of allah they pay for it later on in life i have studied these sometimes and unless they engage in tawbah and change their lives because sometimes people are already married sometimes we who are married we did it the wrong way sometimes so how do you mend that allah says by engaging in istighfar say ya allah we did it we did it wrong ya allah forgive us what happened was not supposed to be my brothers and sisters it is a religious function do it correctly I call upon you really to have your functions of nikah correct no matter what challenges you may face in terms of people saying if it is separated I'm not going to come. Well my brother I've invited you, you want to come, come, you don't want to come, don't come but I want the angels of mercy to be there. So if I'm going to keep it mixed because I want you there then the angels won't come. And if I want the angels there then you won't come, I'd rather you don't come, the angels be there. Allahu Akbar. We have had marriages where people have put on the card the dress code. Well done. 
You say, this is a function of Islamic, or should I say a spiritual nature. Please ensure that you are dressed appropriately. I know of a function where they turned down women who were not dressed appropriately from the door, and it was a marriage. And I said, hats off to them. It's just a pity none of us were wearing hats. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. But my brothers and sisters, I want to now make mention of also a few important points, seeing that we have spent, we have dwelt a lot on reality on the ground. We need to guide one another, remind one another, what is it that will result in the good marriage? Firstly, we need to learn to trust our spouse. You trust this person. I, was, I came across a fatwa recently online of one of the Arab scholars where he issued a ruling saying it is prohibited for you to go through the mobile phones of your spouses. I was shocked. When I read that, I was shocked. He said, spying is not allowed even if it is against your own spouse. You take them at face value, which means you treat your spouse according to how they treat you and so on. They say, if you are going to start the spying game, many things can happen. Sometimes someone can blackmail. Sometimes someone can frame. Sometimes a sin that the man was about to repent from becomes an issue that has made your marriage break. Yet it was between him and Allah. And the same applies to a woman. So whether we agree or disagree with this fatwa, the reality is we learn a lesson from it. We learn a lesson to say, when you spy, what, does, what do you gain from it? What is it? How is the man treating you? How is the woman treating you? If they have a sin between them and Allah, it has affected the treatment between you and them. You raise the treatment. And you may try to cite what the problem is. But for you to convert your life from bringing up your children into spying on a man will not really make you live happily ever after. We know of people whose spouses have cheated on them for 50 years. But they are living happily ever after because they are not even aware of what is going on. It is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not saying that is a good situation or a bad situation, but I'm saying it is a lesson we draw from that, that we should not convert our lives from what we are supposed to be. Yes, it is your right sometimes within certain limits to know what is going on and so on. But at the same time, make sure that it does not result in you reacting in the wrong way so that you break your marriage rather than build it. Help your spouse. Remember, that is the secret. So one is the issue of trust. As much as we say you should trust your spouse, we need to say, do not do something which will make your spouse doubt you. So now you have a man, he's on his phone. Every time he's secretive, he's holding his phone. When his wife comes, he does this. Now, brother, if you don't want to instill that mistrust in her, what are you doing? What is this going to achieve? So now you do this and... He, then he says, didn't you hear the talk? You're supposed to trust me. I'm just testing you whether you are trusting me or not. <laughs> you see, the laughter means this is what some people must be doing. <laughs> I'm testing you whether you trust me or not. Well, that is foolish because you don't do that. Allahu Akbar. Do not invite mistrust. No. Do not invite mistrust. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And... Another mistake that people make, you don't need to confess all your sins to your spouse because they are not Allah. Remember that. They are not Allah. Your spouse is a person. Yes, you will be the closest to them. They will help you through your sin and to eradicate it and so on. But you confess your sin to Allah and you eradicate it as soon as possible. When you are nabbed, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. You may have to say a few things and you may have to make a few promises and so on. But... If your link with Allah is strong, you will not need to worry about your link with your spouse because what will go wrong? What will go wrong? This is it. And this is why we always say, Ittaqullah, Ittaqullah. Look at it four times in those verses. But did we know that? Secondly, the issue of time. My brothers and sisters, many of us are guilty of not spending time with our families. Time will build your relation to the degree that you live happily ever after. Because time is very valuable. Spend time with your wives, your children, your, your family members. Very, very important. Sometimes people sit with their friends. Sometimes they sit on computers. But I'm at home. So what? You're sitting on the computer. It's as good as being somewhere in another country altogether. Because when you are on a computer, and this has happened to all of us, when you are seriously working... They can be talking to you. You don't know what they said. Nothing. You just, you know, <laughs> the, the, the typical one. Would you like some tea? Yes. Did you even hear what they said? 
You didn't. They say, so do you know, today I went to the school, yes. You know, today uh, it was your child's graduation, yes. You know, today he won a prize, yes. But you haven't heard anything. You know, you are very stupid, yes. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Why? Because you didn't hear anything. He just said, yes, yes, because you are busy with, in another continent. That is time. You are not giving time. Set aside a time, put away something, spend it with them. Look at them, talk to them. Wallahi, this is how you will help your children one day to live happily ever after. Because they saw my father did this, I will do it also for my spouse. My mother did this, I will do it for my spouse. Today we have a difficulty. Father is in his own world. Mother is in his own world. And the children are in their own world. When they get married, they are also in their own worlds. Because that is how they grew up watching their parents in their own worlds. But when the father spent time with the mother, they were very fond of each other. They, they, you know, they exchanged these very romantic glances and whatever else may have been within respect in front of the children. Obviously, respect is required. But they need to see that there is affection between the two of you. So when they grow up, they understand that love is not just about the outward looks of a female, but it is something far deep. After my mother gave birth to so many children, still my father considered her as the rose of his life. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Look at this. So the child learns. But no, father is busy. He doesn't have time for mother. But when the secretary walks in, oh yes, how are you? Man? Okay, yes, have a seat. Can I get you some coffee? But mother was asking you if she could get you coffee. Now you are asking her if you could get her some coffee. And this is a totally different person. Allahu Akbar. So the child watches. So what are we doing? We are reducing the chances of the child living happily ever after, let alone ourselves. Because the child is watching. This is why we say spend time with your children. Very important. I put a value at one meal a day with your child is worth 10,000 US dollars and probably more. More because sometimes that meal a day might make your child say something. You guide the child. You spoke to the child. Had it not been for that, they would have got guidance from someone else because they never get a chance with you. And then they make a wrong decision in life which results in their total destruction. What then? It only costed you a meal a day. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This is why get home early. Don't go every day and say there was a lecture tonight. This is why we only remain here for three nights or four and we go away. <laughs> so you cannot go home and say tonight there was a lecture. Which lecture? What did they say? Are you going to say that they said we must not spend time wasting time outside? We must get back home, physically home. Even your friends, believe me. Many marriages have broken because of friends. The friends say, hey, yeah, you know, what, you, what are you doing, man? You know, you, how can you be controlled by your wife? You want to go home. The time is only 10 o'clock, man. The night is still young, but my wife is also young. <laughs> Remember that if the night is young, your wife is even younger. She deserves it more than you. My brothers and sisters, many marriages have been broken because of late nights. People sitting on the internet. People chatting haram way to people they are not supposed to be in touch with. How did it bring you goodness? Wallahi, it doesn't. You want to live happily ever after? Close it. You don't need to be on that chat. It's, it, life will not come to a standstill without you. Believe me. But your real life may come to a standstill with that chat. Do you know that? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us control. The internet is a tool that is so addictive that you lose track of time the minute you are hooked onto it. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us understanding. Another very important point, my brothers and sisters, to live happily ever after, you must be neat and tidy. I know someone might think, well, what does this have to do with, you know, the whole thing? We want to live happily ever after. Sometimes a spouse does not like you because you are shabby and tatty. They cannot tolerate you because, you know, you leave your smelly clothes lying around here and there. You get up and you're not in order. Sometimes you, after you use the loo, it is as though there was a whole chain of people who have used that loo. Allahu Akbar. And you, we leave it so dirty and filthy that the wife feels, now my job, this man married me only to wash after me. Bas, to wash after him. Why is that the case? You need to be neat, be tidy, cleanse yourself, take pride in your dress code for your spouse, for your family to watch. Your children will see that my mom always looks smart and it was not to, uh, to, you know, to attract the man at the mall. No, it was for my dad and for us. And she was always a person, role model in the home. You have dressed smart and prim and prop. Your clothes are good and you know, neat and so on, according to your level. So that is a very important point if you would like to live happily. And if you'd like to live happily ever after, make sure that you are dressed 
prim and prop, neat and smart, and make sure that you have presented yourself as the father of the home or the mother, or a person who is a good spouse who is dedicated towards that marriage. Very important point we spoke about already, I'll just say it, the point of communication. You need to communicate with your children and with your spouse. If you do not communicate with your spouse, you cannot expect that marriage to work. You must have a good relation. They must be able to say to you and you must be able to say to them whatever is in the heart in a respectful way. And remember, how you talk to your spouse also determines how long you will be with them. Because if you keep on screaming and shouting, they won't tolerate it more than a while. After that, they're going to get fed up. They will want to go home. Nobody spoke to them like that in the past. You need to know, speak to them with respect, utter good words. The minute you shout, scream, swear, lie, cheat, deceive, that will not be tolerated more than a certain amount of time. No. So stop screaming and yelling at home. Stop using words that have a better alternative. I have spoken about the term shut up. Shut up is a very bad word. You rather say keep quiet. It enhances your respect and it will achieve more than the term shut up. Have you thought of it? Keep quiet is a far more respectful term, even with your own children. So communication and how to communicate is a skill that will really help you in marriage. Thereafter, one very important point, take correction. When you are corrected, admit your fault and nod your head and appreciate it. Whether you are a man or a woman, even if your wife tells you, you know what, I feel you are wrong. Who do you think you are? I'll send you back home. That's the attitude of today. That's the attitude. No, your wife has the right to tell you, look, I think this relation was unnecessary. I think the way you should handle this should not be in this particular way. You should be thankful. No, I appreciate what you've said and immediately I will do something about it. Mashallah. Now you live because you appreciate they are a female. Females are today big, big CEOs of some of the most successful companies on the globe. Have you realized that? And sometimes in our own home, we don't even give them a say. Allahu Akbar. No say, I'm a Muslim and you are not supposed to tell me anything. You are a female, I'm a male. Where did you get that from? Which Islam are you following, brother? Where in Islam does it say your wife is not allowed to correct you? Show me. Any verse, any hadith, any saying of any of the scholars that wife is not allowed to correct husband? They, the women, have rights over them or they have rights that need to be fulfilled similar to the rights that they would be fulfilling which means the rights are on both sides you fulfill they fulfill like we spoke about spying you do not want her to spy you don't spy on her the same thing subhanallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness so if you would like to have the right to correct her she has the right to correct you too we should not give Islam a bad image by making people feel that, you know what, our women are just slaves. Whatever I say goes. But when you are wrong, she has the right to stand up and say you are wrong. So much so that if you are very wrong, beyond a certain limit, she has the right to actually apply for a nullification of that marriage without even your involvement. And she can get it. Do you know that she can go to the to the Shari court or to the group of ulama who is handling these marital crises and she can say, I would like to apply for a divorce on this grounds, this grounds, this grounds. If those grounds are valid, she will be awarded that after the fulfillment of certain uh, system that takes, you know, certain steps that take place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. So the issue of correction, we need to take correction. I spoke about sacrifice. Sacrifice is the cornerstone of a successful marriage. Remember, young boys and girls, people think, I'm getting married. You see, that's the last smile he smiled. <laughs> you see, I'm getting married. You see, I'm getting married. And when you see him the following morning, he says, I'm married. <laughs> I'm married. But what happened? It took him one night to realize it's a big responsibility on his shoulders. He now needs to look after someone's daughter. He took her with the name of Allah. He needs to provide for her. He needs to make sure that he respects her. He has a new relation. He, his life needs to change. If your life does not change after marriage, then perhaps you don't understand what marriage is all about. This is why we say sacrifice is the cornerstone towards living happily ever after. When you get up the following morning, you need to realize I must get up. I must do this, do that. 
when you are lazy, yesterday I used the term a bag of lazy bones. Wallahi, it's a fact. If you are lazy, you cannot expect to live happily ever after. There is no room for laziness when it comes to marriage, both for the male as well as the female. Get up and work hard to, inshallah, to prosper in that marriage of yours. Then what is very important is to support your spouse, to stand by your spouse, to be fair and just. Here I need to spend a few minutes. What is the meaning of fair and just? Your mother has a problem with your wife. You don't just side with one of them. No, you must be just. You must be fair. If your mother is wrong, she is wrong even if she is your mother. We have an attitude where we say, my mother is my door to paradise. My brother, sometimes your mother is your door to hell. Did you know that? From Islam, I'm telling you, if that mother of yours is oppressive and she is doing something wrong, she could be your door to hell, not to heaven. Do you know that? Wallahi. And I, I, I am saying this with all passion because we have seen a lot of marriages where the mother-in-law thinks she is the queen who is married to the woman who you are married to before you. And then she comes and relays all her unjust instructions, which are absolutely unacceptable. And the man just sits down. That's my mother. That's my mother. That's my mother. How long are you going to keep on saying that's your mother when she is oppressing your wife? Something somehow, somewhere needs to be said. Either speak to your father or tell your mother, Mother, I love you so much. I did not marry this woman for her to be a means of taking my love away from you or your love away from me. The love I have for you is totally different from the love I have for her. So mother, I will love you forever. But I want to tell you this is the line you do not cross my beloved mother and you kiss her forehead. You can kiss her hands and her cheeks and tell her that my mother you are wrong. Lay it down. When you do not lay your territory, your marriage cannot work. People don't know where is my limit. They don't know. So how can your marriage work? Your mother doesn't know. Your father doesn't know. Some fathers issue instructions to their daughters-in-law worse than the instruction of their own son to that wife of theirs. So what was the point? Father, why didn't you just marry this woman one time? That is not fair. You cannot just come and say, that's my daughter-in-law. I must tell her, you stand here, you go there. No, they have their life. Give them their freedom. Understand they too need to grow in marriage to live happily ever after. It's not just you who comes and dish instructions and go out. I know this, what I've said here might be a bit bitter for some people to digest, but it is a fact of life. It is a red button that we press and we need to press it and constantly remind people because when you talk about happily ever after, remember, you need to address issues that are current and valid. Otherwise, you are wasting your time. I cannot speak about a fairy tale because none of us will then learn something by the time we walk out of these doors. So this is why we say you need to be just. Tell your father where he should stand with respect. And please, the parents, do not hate your child just because he needs a bit of time with his wife. No. Or the wife needs time with the husband or the children. No, allow them that. Let them go. You do not have to go everywhere your children go. Uh, we are going for a holiday, for example, to Penang or to Lenkawi. So now Father Nessa says, we are coming with. Okay, you come with, mashallah. The next year we are going to holiday. We are going to this place. We are coming with. The following year we are... So whenever did they go alone? Never. Why? Because mom and dad tag along. Give them once or twice, a few times, give them their own. Tell them, look, you guys go along, inshallah, enjoy yourselves. And next time we will join you. Perhaps you can arrange for us. Yes, it is very important to look after your parents. Believe me, we are not at all undermining that. That is a rule on its own. Look after your parents, but be just when it comes to your relation with them and the relation with your spouse. Be just. Even your children. Some people, and this happens in some homes, they have more than one child. So the children begin to get children. So those children who live with them in the same home, every time we shout them, we pick on them. Why? Because they live in the same home. And when the other son's children come, because they live far away, oh, my son, where were you? What happened? These children are watching. They are seeing. Look at this grandfather of mine. These people here, 
Does he know what they do at school? And here he is embracing them. It is only because we are foolish. Human nature makes us get irritated with those we live with sometimes. And we don't know those who are really irritating are actually so close to us because they are far. This is why we tell parents, sometimes you need to make sure your children live a little bit of a distance from you so that you can be even closer in relation. And I have seen in my life with lots of experience that those children who do not live with their parents are sometimes times closer in relation with their parents they have a better understanding and they have a much better relation and I am not promoting people to abandon their parents no you need never to abandon your parents if you do that you are sinful of the highest order but what we are saying is give each other your breathing space is very important give each other breathing space some women they get married into homes where mother-in-law sits and dishes instruction right today we will cook this 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 I'm inviting 20 people for lunch, 40 people for supper. Tomorrow morning, 60 people for breakfast. But hang on, man. I am one daughter-in-law here. We are a few people here. What's going on? If this happened once a while, it's okay. But you cannot just sit back and dish out instructions as though this is a restaurant. Mashallah, if you really want, I have a friend who owns a restaurant known as Dinemore down the road. Perhaps we can go there. <laughs> Mashallah. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. I had to mention that because, you know, there are a few restaurants we've been to here. And mashallah, the cuisine is something else. So my brothers and sisters, I'm just thinking of it. Probably the cooks are, are, are males, not females. Remember this. When you say food is very nice, a sharp woman would say, well, that's a male cook. Which means now let's eat here every other day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So the point being raised is be just, be fair, be balanced. You cannot keep it lopsided all along because you will have your children. They will grow up. They will get married. How do you like your daughter to be treated? Remember this. Remember, very important point. Then a very important point also is non-comparison in two angles. You want to live happily ever after. Do not compare your marriage to someone else's. Perhaps they have bigger problems than yours which are hidden and you don't know. Don't compare your marriage. You look at your own condition. Are you happy? Is your situation okay? You, have, you are living in a hut, mashallah. You have a bedding on the floor and you are so excited, mashallah. The water is there, everything. The minute you see another man who has a beautiful home, you enter and there is a big bedding there with a lovely mattress and five, six continental pillows, mashallah. And this happens and that. And then you, you come back home and you are upset. Why? You know, those people are living so happily, man. Look at them. Why should you destroy your hut looking at the bungalow of somebody else? You are never going to get there. Allahu Akbar. You are not going to get there. So do not compare your marriage to others. You be happy with your situation for as long as it is okay. You make the most of it. One day if Allah wills, He will grant you even better. Ultimately, we go to Jannah. In Jannah, you get what you want. So comparison in terms of your marriage. Another thing, to compare children also reduces your chances of living happily ever after. You know, and you don't allow this to happen. The worst is when someone enters your home and starts comparing children. Or you yourself in front of your children. This one is very dark in complexion. This one is light in complexion. And the child is hearing. It's not their crime. It's Allah who chose that. And someone, this one is very clever. That one is thick. Thick. The way we say the word thick, it makes them feel thicker. It's a fact. Yes. People call their children stupid, dog, cow, pig, Allahu Akbar. How? How can you live happily ever after when what came out of your system is being called a pig and a dog and a cow? May Allah forgive us. Sometimes in our spur of anger, we utter words that result in the cursing of ourselves. And then we want to know why is it we are not living happily ever after. But brother, my sister, you are calling your son a dog. How could you do that? If your son is a dog, I don't want to ask what it makes you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, very important. Do not utter cutting remarks, calling people names in your own house. We are not even supposed to be doing that out of the house. So this is why we say non-comparison in marriage and non-comparison with children. And don't come and compare the children of one son with the children of another son. The children of one wife with the children of another wife. That is haram. Each one has their own speciality. Who knows when they grow up it might swap. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May he open our doors. Sometimes we make mistakes because of our... Human weakness 
and we come about, we want to start comparing children, you know, my son, that son has very good children, you know, and this one year his children are unruly and so on. Stop saying that. Raise your hands and make a dua to Allah or get to the ground and start resolving the matter by, by trying your best to speak and communicate with the children and seeing what is happening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. I touched a little bit here on the issue of a man who has two wives and he compares the children of either wife and he tells each wife, for example, you know what? You know nothing. That one knows too much and this one knows this and that one. Wallahi, it's a big error. And this is why we say today we need to address the issue of polygamy, not because we want to promote it or demote it, but because it is happening in society. Remember this. The difficulty is not that people do not like polygamy or disagree with it. It is more to do with the way it is done and how people do it. So now you have people who keep it a big secret and after four years it comes, it pops up, you know, like bread coming out of the toaster and it's burnt. Allahu Akbar. And then you expect things to live rosy and you go to make your wife feel like a non-Muslim, you know, to say, you know what, if you do not accept this, then you are not in Islam. Allahu Akbar. What is this? My brothers, you need to be reasonable. These are human beings you are dealing with, not animals. They have feelings. They have a heart. You need to talk to them. You need to make them feel wanted. You need to make sure if you are from amongst those who has more than one spouse, you need to make them feel equally important. You need to go out of your way to build that love with either spouse, if more than one or two, because we are Muslimin, because it happens in our society. You would really be serving yourself the death blow if you had to prefer one over the other in terms of the statements that you make to them or being unfair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Really. You are not allowed to go out to one and to make her feel that she is so low and cheap compared to the other. Why? That is haram, forbidden. Perhaps the one who gave you children first, the one whom you were married to right at the beginning, perhaps that one may stand up for you the day you need it most. And at the same time, you may have benefit from the, the other and perhaps the third and perhaps the fourth, you may have benefit and they may come with their own goodness. So remember, each one comes with a unique goodness. Subhanallah, you need to know how to identify the goodness in each. Why is it that we want to identify the weakness and we want to get irritated? And remember, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for women to come to terms with this. If you are a man and you are a real Muslim, and you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you want to follow the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will realize and understand that your spouse is only but a human being. You need to stand up and make them feel as wanted as ever. It is not difficult to make your wife feel like she is the queen and to make the other one feel like she is exactly the same queen. Allahu Akbar. It's not difficult. But you need to know and you need to realize the statements that come out of your mouth mean a lot. Go out of your way to utter good words. Don't compare things. And remember, we as Muslimin are taught to work on the goodness and to identify and praise the goodness. You know, I was asked a question by one young man. This question has repeated itself so many times. Perhaps I have received more than a thousand emails in this regard. People who are hooked on to pornography. So they tell you, and this is an example, I'm bringing it up for a reason. They tell you, you know, we are young and you know, uh, one, one brother says, I, I try to leave this, but I really can't. What is it? What can I do? Now, it's not easy to advise someone, especially from long distance and you don't know who they are. So one of the best ways of advising them is the advice of some of our scholars who have given the following advice. They say, when you have a sin that you are engaged in, you are trying your best to come out of it, but you are falling back into it. You are trying your best to come out of it, falling back into it. One of the ways of tackling it, obviously, is to increase your good deeds so much so that your bad deeds will become automatically decreased. When you increase your salah, your tilawa, your, your condition of wudu, 
your dhikr, your goodness, your going to the masjid, your attending the Islamic lectures or talks or lessons or the schools and what have you. So your good deeds have increased so much and your dhikr and what have you has increased. Automatically your bad decreases. When you do not have enough good deeds, your bad deeds increase because you now have time in the day to do those bad things. Now, this is a very important lesson for all of us in anything and everything we do. Increase your good deeds and you'll find your bad deeds decreasing automatically. If you read your five salah in the masjid every day, you will find it difficult to commit adultery. It will be not easy for you to go into the gambling and casinos. It will become difficult for you to waste your time on the phone because you are worried about getting up for salatul fajr. And I want to get to the masjid 10 minutes before the time of salah. Allahu Akbar. Then, are you going to waste your time? No, it's cut off. Switch off the phone, put it away. They say, what if it is an emergency? They will call you on the landline. That's what they used to use many years ago. When I hear the landline ring at my home, I know it is an important call. Because those who have your landline number are those who need to have your number. May Allah grant us goodness. I hope landlines work. There are some countries, they're not even worried about landline anymore. You ask them landline, they just... You know, they give you the typical uh, Asian head shake, you know. Just, you don't even know whether it means yes or no. And you don't even know what they're trying to say. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us goodness. And really, may He grant us the love of one another for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, here we are. We have spoken for more than an hour on how to live happily ever after growing in marriage and we have addressed the real challenges that are faced by society and community today we have spoken even we have touched a little bit on those who have more than one wife and what they should do and what they shouldn't do and as i said the reasons we made mention of this is because it's a reality on the ground and even those who might be contemplating remember that spouse of yours has a heart that spouse of yours is a human being. They may feel this way, that way. If you are not ready to rise to the challenges of trying to uh, assist that spouse of yours to accept what you have done or what you are doing, then you don't deserve to have done that. And you do not fit into that league. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. You'd rather live happily with one woman than to live really from pillar to post with another one or a third one or a fourth one. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist all those who have taken the step in that direction and all those who perhaps would like to take a step in that direction. My sisters, that is something very challenging. But at the same time, if you rise to it, the goodness that comes out of it sometimes far outweighs the few challenges you might face in trying to accept it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us every form of goodness. Seeing that this is the last talk that I have for this particular series of uh, 2012 here in Sri Lanka, I'd like to spend a few moments still mentioning one or two points that I have actually jotted down. We have some, something known as a false promise in marriage, where people promise their spouses the world and then they do not deliver. That is a very big crisis. You tell your wife, you know, we will live together for one year and after that we get our own place. Ten years have passed, we have more than the people we had in this home, in the home. Where is my privacy? What is going on? I have my children now. Your brother is married, he has his children, he is here. Sister is married, husband, they are here. The other brother is getting married, they are planning to live here. Where am I staying? Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, these are challenges that we face. Perhaps maybe not in this country always, but I know in countries that I visit and even where I come from, people make false promises. We will get you this, we will do this, I will take you for Umrah, we will go on holiday every year. Don't make these big promises if you cannot fulfill them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May He open our doors. And really, I am very humbled to see the large crowds of people that attend. I'd like to extend the my gratitude to those who have arranged this you know we have a team here known as the a team jazakumullah khair for all of you may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all goodness and all the brothers and sisters who have attended this evening i have kept you much longer in this venue where as you can see brothers have been standing as long as i have been standing i was about to say you know sorry for having kept you standing but the reality is i'm also standing so inshallah for as long as my legs are still on the ground I think inshallah, I hope and I pray we have benefited. As I said, there are points we have discussed this evening.
which are points that are real. They are on the ground. We face them. They are challenges. And this was a means of letting you know how through experience and through the little bit that Allah has given us, we would be able to move forward inshallah in a way that would result in us living happily ever after. May Allah grant that to us until we meet again next year. If Allah wills, we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad.